Okay, 7 o'clock. We believe we're starting on time. We know there are several people who are late, but um, we're going to get, get started. I want to uh, acknowledge that uh, two of our the friends at the aquarium have made possible this course, Dr. Dominic and Margaret P. Cristofaro, and I hope that they're watching at home. And Dom and Marge, thank you very much. So these are the things that my hope is that by the end of this course, we will have done a pretty good job of getting our arms around. What is ocean exploration? How does it differ from research? Why is it important? Who are the leaders? You're going to meet two of them tonight and over the course of this, the next four um, classes, you'll meet many more. And then we're also going to show you a video that is still being made in which a number of others have been interviewed. We want to explore what the challenges are, technological, scientific, financial. I suppose we should have had on there political, right? <laughs> political? Why? why? Why have all of us been so ineffective at making the case for ocean exploration? And my hope is that there will be some ideas that will come out of this and the film that we might make a more compelling case. The um, Rick Spinrad, whom I'm going to introduce in just a minute, NOAA has the lead in ocean exploration. The budget for uh, 2016 is what, 23 million, 25? Something like that. And um, NASA's planning an, a mission to Europa the ice-covered one, the ice-covered moons of Jupiter, looking for life. It's going to cost two to three billion dollars with a B. And if we had that amount of money on a one-time basis, we could map the entire world ocean to a resolution that we have only for parts of the moon and, and Mars, but certainly very little of the world ocean. So those are the things that we want to accomplish. And a lot of this goes back to a program that we did here in July of 2013. We did this with NOAA, and if you're interested in this report, you can go to the Aquarium's website and you could download the report. And it was to map out what the priority should be for ocean exploration. And uh, our first speaker is the chief scientist at NOAA, Dr. Richard Rick Spinrad. He's an internationally recognized scientist and executive with more than 30 years of experience. He's been at NOAA. Uh, this is his second tour of duty at NOAA. He was at the Navy to begin with. Then he was at Oregon State University as the vice president for research. He's an outstanding science administrator. And when those of us who are very closely involved with NOAA heard that he was coming back to be the chief scientist, we all were very, very delighted because we, we believe that he's a great, great leader. He led the White House committee that developed the nation's first set of ocean research priorities and he oversaw the revamping of NOAA's research enterprise. The first time he was at NOAA, he was the head of the Office of the Ocean and the Atmospheric Research OAR and also the head of the National Ocean Service and uh, he's received a number of presidential awards from George W. Bush and from Barack Obama. He was the president of the Oceanography Society. He's president-elect of the Marine Technology Society, fellow of the American Meteorological Society, the Marine Technology Society, and the Institute of Marine Engineering, Science and Technology. He got his BA from a place I'm familiar with, Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, and he got his MS and his PhD degrees in oceanography from Oregon State. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Rick Spindler. Thank you, Jerry. We mic'd up okay? Sounds like Jerry. I think I gave you my start. You did give me my start. But, and, and the backfill on that is that um, 40 years ago, uh, I went out to sea on my first cruise with a young professor named Jerry Schubel uh, out in Chesapeake Bay. Uh, it was a, uh, an eye-opening experience and obviously helped me set a great path with great mentorship. Thank you for that, Jerry. Uh, and it's been fun working with you over the last 40 years, I should add. 
So what I'd like to try to do here today is talk a little bit about some general perspectives about ocean exploration and make a, take a shot at trying to define what we mean by the ocean exploration enterprise. And I want to start by putting it in a context that is uh, really very familiar for those for those of us at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And I would argue that exploration is in our DNA. And in fact, if you go back to uh, Thomas Jefferson's original casting of the Lewis and Clark expedition, it was framed in an exploration context. And they were charged by Jefferson to basically find a route to the Pacific and also uh, enumerate all of the wonderful flora and fauna they're finding and, and also, interestingly, take note of the environmental conditions. And the phrase that was used, I have to refer to my notes, they were told by Jefferson, in addition to measuring the temperature and the winds, to also record the access and recess of frost as they cross the United States. I love that phrase, access and recess of frost. In fact, I like it so much, I'm going to go back and see if the weather service will start using that phrase in their <laughs> forecast. We need it in the Northeast these days. But the point is, what you're seeing here is actually uh, a, a database of weather observations that were taken by Lewis and Clark. This happens to be from the summer of uh, 1805 in Montana. I had the opportunity a few years ago to see some of their other observations, including when they were camped out at uh, Camp Mandan in uh, their first winter, where they were observing incredible temperatures. The remarkable thing about what Lewis and Clark did is that we have now recognized the quality of their data were so good that we can do climatological studies based on the observations they made over 200 years ago. And there's been some researchers who've written, up, uh, written that up. The other thing that Thomas Jefferson did immediately after the Lewis and Clark expedition was done, the Corps of Exploration finished their, the uh, Corps of Discovery finished their, their survey was he set up the first science-based service agency for the United States. It was a survey of the coasts, 1807. So there's some of us at NOAA who actually argue we are the oldest science-based agency within the US federal government because the survey of the coast eventually became the Coastal Geodetic Survey. It eventually became the National Geodetic Survey, which is part of NOAA. And it was the genesis for what we do at NOAA, and we characterize it as environmental intelligence. And I'll say a little bit more about it. You will see that I, as I talk about environmental intelligence, exploration fits into that context very nicely. So environmental intelligence, the best way to think about it, it is that it is the timely, actionable, and reliable information upon which decision makers or individuals or corporations or governments can make decisions about policy practice operations. For us at NOAA, we're focusing on a number of different areas that it really pertains to. And what I want to talk about in, in this general context is resilience. And you'll see where I'm going with this in terms of the value of exploration to support information needs for environmental information to become environmental intelligence. So let's talk about resilience in this context. I want you to think about what happened with Superstorm Sandy as it hit the East Coast two and a half years ago. And I want you to think about it in the context of environmental intelligence. What I'm going to show you in a minute is a uh, video of the actual uh, satellite detection of the storm. And then the video will stop after you see the storm start to form down here. And what you'll see after that is a forecast, a projection of what that storm track is going to do. Think timely, actionable, reliable information. And what does that mean? So let's go ahead and run this video and watch the storm form. You're going to see the storm forming down in here. There it is. It's going to go up the coast. It's going to stop. Now watch what happens. There is the forecast. See that? with the cone of uncertainty, and watch the track the storm takes. That's about as accurate a forecast as you're going to get. And what's remarkable about that, any of you who've lived on the East Coast or followed tropical cyclones, that is an unbelievable track. That's not the usual track for a cyclone like that. Usually they go out like it. They used to say they go safely out to sea, and then a few of us oceanographers said, well, it's not so safe but out to sea when it goes out there, if you're in the middle of it. The point here, 
is that the information that was provided really did some incredible things. So because there were buoys, moorings, gliders, and I suspect you'll hear some more about gliders and other technology from last a little bit, because we had that capability to make observations, we had the environmental intelligence to tell the communities in the Northeast what to do. A few examples, the elderly and poor who were living in basement apartments in Hoboken, New Jersey, were told two days beforehand, get out of the apartment move to a friend's house, move to higher ground. Hundreds of lives were saved. The other example I love is you look at the date. So the date was uh, just before um, Halloween in 2012. It's the time when goods and products are being shipped into the Northeast in preparation for the Christmas holiday buying season. So a lot of ships were moved into New York and New Jersey harbors. Because of that forecast you just saw, they were revectored down towards Virginia and up towards New England. The result of that is that because of the environmental intelligence that agencies like NOAA were providing, the products and services were able to be delivered on time. In fact, the ports resumed operation in less than a week because they were prepared and had the information that they needed to move forward. So I like to point out that NOAA, among other agencies, because of all the wonderful environmental intelligence that was provided, actually saved Christmas in 2012. <laughs> it doesn't hurt that hurricanes also hit during appropriation season back in Washington. So we have some wonderful case studies here of how the environmental intelligence supported a number of important decisions that were made. FEMA has said that they are able to, if they have an accurate, a skillful forecast with four days lead time, they can position the uh, ice trucks and, uh, and the temporary housing and all of that. They actually don't need five days, they don't need seven days, four days works just fine. So that tells us something about how to build the uh, environmental intelligence that we want. Another really good example comes from what happened with Deepwater Horizon back in 2010. Now in this case, it's less about the forecast, because obviously something like this is not really forecastable, but it's about how do you get the baseline information? How do you know that there's been some damage? And NOAA, by law, is responsible for something called the Natural Resource Damage Assessment. Well, how are you going to assess it? Against what? You have to be able to go out there, and now we're starting to talk about exploration. Because you don't know what's going to be impacted. You don't know what's down there. It's as if I told you that there was going to be a major storm in some part of California you'd never been to before. You'd want to go explore that area before the storm came so you could see what the damage assessment is after the storm. And in fact, back in 2008, there were a number of surveys done in the Gulf of Mexico in areas around here. This red star is where the uh, Macombo drill, the Deepwater Horizon uh, well, uh, was located. And, and what you see is pretty healthy uh, corals, uh, brittle stars, a lot of benthic bottom uh, flora and fauna that appear to be in pretty good shape. Now, I would argue that the downside of this story is that we didn't have the whole area carpet. We don't have environmental intelligence for all of the Gulf of Mexico. In fact, there are a lot of people who say that we really only have this kind of information to accurate resolution for about 5% of the ocean bottom. And in some areas, it's particularly important. In an area like the uh, Gulf of Mexico, you really suffer if you don't have it. As it turns out, Deepwater Horizon hit late April 2010. We were able to get back out there in November of 2010. And that's what some of these girls look like. Here's the, here's the flaw in my argument, though. This is not the exact same location as where the previous images were taken from. But we can probably make some assumptions that the, the relative health of this coral was probably similar to what these corals looked like in 2008. And you can see there are, uh, there's clear evidence, even if you are not a coral physiologist, you can see it's covered with some kind of a, a flock, some kind of slime, both of these. And in fact, the brittle stars uh, appear to be healthy, but uh, that's because if you look very closely, you can see there are just little tiny bits of healthy coral left. You can see some of the tips on some of these look kind of healthy. But overall, 
there's some sense of what the damage is. My argument here is a weak one because we don't have a substantive, clear, unequivocal baseline upon which to base that damage assessment with just these two slides. But the argument I'm trying to make is that that's why you need to go out and explore, to understand what the origins are. There's some other uh, applications and concepts that we need to have in place for justifying ocean exploration. This is the chart of the East Coast of the United States, not a map, a chart, okay? Um, from about before 2010. And the important point is that these areas here look reasonably highly resolved, like we've got a lot of accuracy in there. Well, we don't, we really don't, because we didn't have the technology. We would use things like Loran for geolocation. We had uh, I would say less than accurate acoustic systems for acquiring bottom depth and bottom morphology. We would tend to tow a camera system, and now imagine that you're a mile or so above that camera system, towing it on a ship that's going six or seven knots. You don't really know exactly where that camera system is. So all of this adds to the lack of resolution. So it would be good to, to explore this. Well, why? It would be good to explore because you want to have better resolution. You want to have a better understanding of what the shape, features, bottom morphology, what's underneath the, uh, the ocean bottom itself. What are the features that might be of some significance? Significance in the context of what resources are there, or what resources do we need to protect? So between 2011 and 2014, we had roughly two dozen cruises going out exploring this area of the ocean, basically saying we know there's got to be more features and more substance and more interesting uh, phenomena, flora and fauna in this area. Let's go out and use state-of-the-art systems. And I'll talk a little bit about the technology development in a minute. And what we did was we went to these areas, the canyons, the Northeast Atlantic canyons. And again, uh, New York is right up here. This is the area that we subjected to an intense survey. And you can start to get some sense here of the kind of resolution we're getting in the images. Now, in some cases, that resolution can get down to a centimeter. If, if you're really focusing on it and intensely mapping. Well, why do you need to have that kind of resolution? Well, the answer is that it turns out what we may have thought in the past was just kind of barren ocean bottom with no particular value for fisheries actually turns out to be specific habitat for specific kinds of fish, fisheries. And what you see in this case is that areas where we had deep corals and uh, blue stars were presumed to be barren of any of that kind of life form because previous exploration activities didn't have a resolution, couldn't isolate where these observations were being made. And these turn out to be very important with respect to management of our fisheries, but also stewardship of our natural resources. And in fact, the Mid-Atlantic Fisheries Commission, who basically makes recommendations about what fisheries should be open when and how, and what should be preserved, has in effect said we need to reconsider all of the fishing regulations associated both with this area of the Atlantic in light of these new observations this new information that's coming from our exploration activity. The other thing that comes out of this is we discover new resources. And up until about a year ago, we really had no idea how much methane was in this area of the coastal environment, in the shelf area and in the shelf break. And what we found through two technologies, basically, the optical technologies, photography, we found extensive methane hydrate deposits. Methane hydrates are basically uh, frozen methane within a water crystal structure. And we found those because we could see features that looked like they were methane. And acoustically, and I'll explain this later, we could actually detect the methane bubbles coming out. We couldn't do that before. And this was all done without an a priori hypothesis that we will find methane, we will see the bubbles. It was based on saying, we need to go take a look at what's out there. We do need to explore this environment. Methane hydrates, if you've not seen them before, are absolutely fascinating. The first uh, 
researchers who pulled up methane hydrates years ago weren't sure what they had until they found they could light them on the deck. Imagine that you pull up this, basically looks like an ice, that's something you pull out of your ice box, like a big ice cube, but you can light it. <laughs> now that begs some questions with respect to resources, which gets me to the other aspect of ocean exploration. Exclusive economic zone, our EEZ. This is the part of our country that most people don't realize is part of the United States. 800 plus thousand square miles defined by law as at least 200 miles off the coast as you go up and down our coast. And you can see it includes our territories, it includes Alaska, it includes all of our formal holdings as a nation. The interesting thing is that under international law, not only is it the 200 nautical miles offshore of the coast, but if you can make an argument that, that the features, the geological features, the morphological features, extend offshore even farther than 200 miles, and there's a complicated set of calculations associated with that, you can justify adding to your exclusive economic zone. How do you know that? You explore. You look at what that environment looks like. Speculatively, we believe that, uh, and incidentally, this ex an exclusive economic zone is four times the size of the Louisiana Purchase, if you want to tie it back to Jefferson again. So think of all the big flurry of activity associated with the Louisiana Purchase. We automatically got three times that land mass, or four times that land mass, by the definition of the exclusive economic zone. And wait, there's more. Because what we think we can do is we think we can expand this to include these blue areas. That's the extended continental shelf. That's the area that we believe if we adequately explore, we can justify internationally as being part of our nation. Imagine adding another 800,000 square miles to our national holdings. And it's part of the exclusive economic zone, so we need to understand what the economic implications are. How are you going to do that? How much methane is there? Are, are there habitats that ought to be preserved? The only way you're going to do that is by exploring that particular environment. And are you talking about the EZ on the West Coast? Or the East Coast or both? Yes, all of them. West Coast, East Coast, Hawaii, Midway Islands, Puerto Rico, all of the holdings. If you draw a 200-mile perimeter around, that's, that's where the small islands, like Johnson Atoll, look at the size of that EDZ. It's basically a circle with a 200-mile radius. I mean in the expansion you're talking about both coasts? Yeah, the expansion, if you watch what happens when I hit the slide here, the blue will come up. That's the extended continental shelf. So if you look here, it's this blue area, it's that blue area, it's in the Atlantic, it's in the Pacific. It's up on the, the Beaufort and Chukchi Sea as well, and the, uh, a little bit in the Barents Sea. It's in the West Pacific. It's everywhere. Rick, to what extent is that a function of ratifying the, the law of the sea? Yeah, so ratifying the law of the sea is an important piece of that. We obviously need to do that. We are, as a nation, operating, and we, as a science-based service agency, are operating on the assumption that when we ratify it, we will have to make these claims. So as a scientist, my view is you don't want to wait until you've got that ratification in hand. You want to have this argument well in place. Are other countries in line to make similar claims? Yes. Maybe across the same areas? Uh, not, uh, well, actually, interesting. There are some areas that are obviously in debate. So the Arctic is one. Uh, because there are different arguments as to who controls what. The, the Russians, for example, claim that the Lomonosov Ridge, which basically runs across the Arctic, is all an extension of their continental shelf, and therefore they should have all of the Arctic. Uh, and, and you can imagine similar other uh, arguments uh, abound, especially where you've got those kind of complicated borders. So, you know, you talk about a complicated area in the South China Sea, there's a lot of issues there. Even without the extended continental shelf, there's a lot of issues. Yes? Would these things be argued um, like bilaterally or through the UN? Or how we it, yeah, there's, a, there's an adjudicating body, an international adjudicating body, that, that basically those nations that have ratified 
the, uh, treaty, the United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea, unclose as we call it, uh, and, and defer to that as you and anybody make those decisions. I was just curious, north of the Aleutian Islands, there's a huge expanse, and then uh, around Hawaii, it looks like more than 200 miles. Why is it so big in the Aleutians? And then what's that little arc that looks more politics than science? Well, uh, the, so, Jerry, we have three hours for this. <laughs> So I'll give you a quick answer. In order to do this right, you need to look at first, that's why, that's the current EEC as defined by the 200. This basically uh, adds up in here the piece that we would argue is geologically tied in but stops at, in that case, what is clearly the Russian EEZ. Uh, similarly, Hawaii, let's see if I go back here, Hawaii, uh, if you know about the geology of Hawaii, the uh, shelf drops off very quickly, they're volcanoes. And so it's a very hard argument to make that you're extending the shelf from there when three or four miles offshore, you're already in 3,000 feet of water, 3,000 meters of water. So that's where that um, somewhat complicated geological calculation comes in. But Hawaii is really a good, good example because if you know Hawaii, you know there's, as compared with, say, uh, the West Coast, we're all use the East Coast, which has a much shallower shelf, and you can see you really extend out far when you make that argument. Does that make sense? Very good. Thank okay. So what I talked about mostly here are a few case studies on the value of ocean exploration in terms of getting baseline information, in terms of uh, justifying uh, some of our policy and economic uh, arguments, and uh, also uh, in terms of managing our resources, knowing where habitat is for fisheries, uh, knowing what are the unique species that live in these environments. I want to take just a couple of minutes and give another justification for ocean exploration. It's actually one I know Lance is going to allude to extensively in his talk, and that's technology development. I love this slide because um, my staff argued that we got to put all these really cool exploration slides in here from NASA. And here's my pitch. Jerry, you heard Jerry's argument about the dollars and cents figure. I will tell my colleagues at NASA that their job's pretty easy. <laughs> How do you communicate with a Mars rover? Radio. Radio frequency. How far is that radio signal going to go in, in the ocean? Oh, maybe that far if you got a real heavy blaster going. <laughs> What's the pressure on that environment? It's around an atmosphere, a little less on Mars. What's the pressure that we're operating at? Up to 10,000 pounds per square inch. How do you communicate with things underwater? Mostly acoustically. That's really hard to focus an acoustic system. The ocean environment, the environment here on Mars is somewhat corrosive. The ocean environment is a saltwater environment. All sorts of other chemicals in there. Anybody who lives close to the coast knows that's a very corrosive environment. So I have no problem telling my friends at NASA that we have a much harder time building technology that can operate in the ocean compared to what they have to do to just fly some little rover up to a planet and land it on there. <laughs> the trouble is that we as oceanographers tend to say exactly what Jerry said. In order to do this, we need a hundred million dollars. We only have ten million. That's okay. We've got the tape and bailing wire. We can do it. We can do it. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the things we do. And one of the advantages of an ocean exploration program is in developing unmanned vehicles. And I'll, I'll focus specifically on one that we use off our dedicated ocean exploration vessel, the Ocean Okeanos Explorer. Um, and really what I would argue the benefit of a program that's dedicated to ocean exploration is, is it allows us to test new standards of operations in how we run these systems. And in this particular case, uh, we have a vehicle uh, this is the vehicle here called the uh, uh, Deep, uh, Deep Discoverer, I believe. Um, and this particular uh, vehicle weighs about 9,800 pounds, has six cameras, multiple degrees of freedom. But the real kicker on this is that in terms of standards of operation, any fishermen in the room? So you know that when you're in a small boat, you're actually rely on a the roll and the pitch and the yaw of that boat to move your roar around and take advantage of that. It's almost impossible to throw something over the side of, the, of a ship and not have it bobbing around, not having the ship motion translate down to that particular vehicle. 
But the technology development that's really been cool, and it's come largely out of ocean exploration activities, is to basically tether that remotely operated vehicle to another platform which can take up the slack, as you will, from the ship rolling. And better way to see it, rather than me trying to describe it to you, is I'm going to show you a video which is absolutely stunning. So if we can go ahead and run that. This is some uh, video from uh, the west coast here. It's in uh, about 1,000 meters of water. And what you're going to see is, uh, uh, I'm sorry, this is up off the uh, Indonesian coast. And it's in about 3,200 meters of water. <laughs> Uh, all the more remarkable. You are seeing video footage, high definition video footage, of an organism that's never been seen before. It's a type of sea cucumber. It lives near the bottom. Remember, this is uh, probably about 6,000 pounds per square inch pressure. There's a uh, laser positioner. You should see it. You'll see two red dots. I know we saw them at the start of this video. You'll see them at some point here. The system is set up to put two lasers on anything it sees parallel, 10 centimeters apart, so you get some idea of the size of this thing. Now look at that. That's just exquisite. I could watch this for hours. How it's moving. I don't know what this stuff is inside. I'm a physical geographer, so I don't know what that stuff is in there. But it's obviously got some filter feeding going on. But every time we go down with this system, we see things that have never been seen before. And the point is that if you remember my analogy of sitting in a, in a, a fishing boat trying to keep something stable down below, this is remarkable stability. For taking a picture a couple of miles away in the dark, in great pressure, this technology development I would argue is as remarkable as anything we've done with something like the Mars rover. Okay. I want to talk about another example of technology development that's come out of ocean exploration. And this is this is a combination of activities, and it really comes down to using acoustics to do things we never thought we could do before. I don't know if we've got any Navy veterans in the audience here at all. So SOSIS is the system. The sound surveillance system that was developed during the Cold War to detect Soviet submarines. It's a static system. It sits in the ocean and listens for stuff to go by. The community of ocean exploration said, why can't we use that to detect other stuff? If we tune the frequencies right, why can't we use that system to detect seafloor earthquake? Why can't we use it to detect volcanic activity? Why can't we use it to detect noise uh, and the impact of that noise on marine organisms. So there have been some wonderful results that have come out of taking an existing technology and adapting it for another application. In this case, three different applications. And you see on the lower right here just some of the stuff that's come out of those kinds of studies using the SOSIS array. We've been able to figure out what are the acoustic ranges that these various organisms are most sensitive to. And I think you're all familiar with this. It's, a, it's a, uh, an area of great controversy with respect to everything from uh, naval testing in areas where there are whales, to oil and gas operations, to commercial shipping. In fact, there's been a number of National Academy of Sciences studies on just how noisy is it down there, and what, what, what is the frequency of the noise? Is it low frequency noise that mostly affects the baleen whales? Or is it higher frequency stuff that affects the porpoises? And what you see here uh, in this upper left hand corner is just a graphical depiction of how sensitive this Celsius array is to earthquake detection compared to the systems that are used on land. And the answer is because we can tune the systems in the ocean more effectively and they're not bothered, if you will, or overwhelmed by other acoustic signals, we can actually do a better job. So the number of dots indicates the detections of earthquakes, and you can see the SOSIS array is actually providing more observations in the same time period than the land uh, system. I'm going to show you some uh, video a little bit of what goes on with respect to the acoustic systems and the optic systems. But what I'd like to do is show you another concept. So the SOSIS array that I talked about is a fixed array. It's there, it sits there. It's great, but it's really only like in one part of the ocean. Wouldn't it be cool if you could do that just about anywhere you want? So the exploration community said, let's take the same concepts and build them into a portable 
uh, acoustic detection system. So let's go ahead and run this, and what you're going to see, this, does this have audio that we can hear? It's got some cool audio on it. that are being transmitted through the sound channel. So whales are smart. They figured out where to go in the ocean to transmit their noise, their sound in a way that it can actually be transmitted over thousands of kilometers. What you saw there was the system being acoustically released by a ship to pick up the, the data package to then do all the analysis on it. You can take that system and put it anywhere you want to get a full characterization of all the acoustics that's going on. If you decide we really got an issue, we need to monitor earthquakes in the Bering Sea, you could go put a system like that in there. If you're interested in understanding what are the whales doing in the southern Indian Ocean, you could put a system like that in there as well. It was the discovery of these system of these acoustic signatures that allowed us to build this system. Yes? That looks like there's a time delay until you retrieve the data and social security. Yes, absolutely. Good catch. So the newer versions of that system are actually using acoustic modems to transmit the data to a surface mooring and then use uh, uh, telemetry through satellites back to a land base. The problem is it's a really difficult problem to put in a mooring with a surface manifestation in 4,000 meters of water. It's a lot easier to put something that's just under the surface. You don't have to deal with the catenary and all the engineering challenges associated with surface mooring. Um, so one of the interesting challenges on this one is, or interesting opportunities, is if you recall, we had that ship coming by to pick up the mooring. What we're looking at is unmanned surface vehicles that can actually serve as data collection devices. So you don't have to worry about having a surface mooring. You got the unmanned vehicles just basically holding station. You transmit the data to it. We're doing that actually for some of the tsunami detection right now. So uh, what I want to do is show you another video if I can. And this one, the, the point here is that I've talked separately about acoustic detection and, uh, and optical detection, photographic detection. What if you combine it? What can you learn? What is worth exploring? And what you're going to see here is something you could not do from a land basis. What you're looking at is a volcanic eruption. It also has sound associated with it. So we'll just take a couple of minutes and you'll realize how exciting from an exploration and science standpoint having a data stream like this is. And you'll also realize that you can stand off this volcanic eruption basically by the distance that I'm standing away from you right now. Hard to do on land. Go ahead. about picking up the methane bubbles, the same concept here. In this case, it's, it's the mag magma gas bubbles. This is just a static image, similar to what you saw. Think about taking uh, slices out of the video we just saw. Except now, we can actually start quantifying this in terms of uh, meaningful measurables, like the, the acoustic pressure, and use this to identify, OK, now I see this is a signal when I see it next time, I will know that's a magma bubble. I will know that's a methane stream. And a methane stream would have a very different signature than this would have. So we've taken the exploration site, let's go take a look, figure out what this is, and translated it now to a capability that can be used by the research community, the operational community, to actually build new observations or new understanding about what's going on in the ocean. 
we're not limited to underwater vehicles. I, I want to say just a quick word about some of the exploration that we're doing on marine phenomena and marine organisms using aerial vehicles. And, and the, the catchphrase that we tend to use for these unmanned aerial vehicles is they cover the dull, the dirty, and the dangerous. And so why and where would you fly one of these? Well, for example, we're very concerned about some of the populations of uh, killer whales, especially some of the northern Pacific killer whale populations. And we don't really understand their health. We don't understand where they're going to feed. We don't understand how they, how they move and migrate in various health conditions. We can use a quadcopter like that and get tracking images like this. And trust me, the marine mammologists confirmed that this particular image of this pod of uh, northern Pacific orcas shows uh, one that's not in particularly good health, several that are healthy, and one that's pregnant. By using the quadcopter at about 1,000 feet, we have every reason to believe these wells are not bothered. They, I'm sure they can detect that, but something that small at that altitude won't bother them in the same way that a ship would obviously bother them, a large aircraft might bother them. We can do the same thing with other vehicles, a hand-launched uh, unmanned aerial vehicle, a drone, to get some understanding of population dynamics. And this is another case where there's really no way that you could get uh, a full census of Hawaiian monk seals uh, with a manned airplane. Uh, because that would definitely scare them into the water. Uh, it's very expensive to do that. A lot of times uh, you want to have a capability for uh, going back repeatedly over a long period of time. It's a lot easier to do that with a, uh, a drone like this. You can start doing some specific quantification. So all of these various technologies have been developed out of exploration. People didn't go in and say, we're going to go out and use this vehicle to test population dynamics of wine monk seals. What they basically said is, let's go see what we can find. Find these. Let's try some of the things that are dull, dirty, and dangerous. Uh, so measuring uh, sea ice extent, uh, looking for marine debris, garbage in the ocean, monitoring marine mammals like this, all really good examples of using, exploring with these kind of unmanned aerial vehicles. Say a couple of words about one other important aspect of exploration, and it's the telecrisis piece. I would argue that the exploration community has been at the leading edge for telepresence. And I've got to give credit to people like Bob Ballard who really revolutionized the thinking about telepresence. The uh, fascinating statistic in The Economist just this week, five, 10 years ago, it cost $8 to transmit every megabyte of data. 10 years ago, $8. My presentation is 95 megabytes. So, Jerry, I don't know if it's worth $750 or not, but that's what it would have cost 10 years ago. Now it's down to cents, uh, less than a couple of cents per megabyte. That's the kind of technology change that has made telepresence uh, a real capability. And, and what you see here is uh, various examples of it. I'm going to show you a real example, real life example of telepresence in a minute. But the point I'm trying to make is this. Remember, I talked about the exploring Atlantic Canyons uh, cruises and exploration work that we did just this last fall. These are the people who were involved. Now, those of you who have been on a ship know usually you can have a dozen people on a ship. Uh, this is a way of getting some of the experts. Oh, I love this. So we had a researcher at Montana State exploring the Atlantic Canyons in real time because of telepresence. It, this may not sound like much to folks who live, you know, we now live in an environment where every one of us has a cell phone, you can reach out anywhere. When I remember I told you about that first cruise I was on with Jerry. Shortly after that, I went on a cruise to Peru and basically, I had no way of communicating with my major professor, my fiance, anybody for months and months. It is a dramatic change to have the bandwidth and the observational capability to get the information back into the schools. In fact, Bob Ballard had a great idea a few years ago. He said, why don't we use the American Idol algorithm for telepresence? So now we'll put an ROV down in a canyon somewhere and we'll ask 10 million kids, should we turn left or should we turn right? And everybody gets to vote. The point is it's a way of engaging students. It's a way of engaging the public. For me, it's a way of engaging, oh, I don't know, a senator from Oklahoma on issues about what's going on in the ocean. Really incredible capability. Right now, 
our research, our exploration vessel, the Okeanos Explorer, is on a cruise south of Puerto Rico. Uh, they left from Kings, uh, Kingston, Rhode Island uh, last week. They're going to be operating in this little purple area. They're better, easier to see it here. To do exactly what we were talking about earlier with respect to the Atlantic canyons, take a look at what's there, uh, what features, what, what organisms, what habitats. And what we're going to try to do here now is get a live feed from the ship. And the point is, I'm not really sure, what, I know what we're going to pull up. I'll know when I see it. But we're going to get a live feed right from the ship. So let's go ahead and click on that link. And that will be my closing activity here. You have to click on the uh, arrow there. Let's see what we got. They are, uh, they were waiting for a part this afternoon. Yeah, okay, this is great. So right now, the ship is steaming. <laughs> you can tell that. South of Puerto Rico. Great, yeah. So uh, this is just a webcam on, on the uh, after deck. This is a webcam of the uh, command center for the exploration activities. This is a multi-beam image being acquired as we speak. Yeah, you can see it's changing. So they are mapping the canyons of Puerto Rico right now. That's what you're looking at. This is another sonar system. And it's basically looking at the water column. So th this system is looking at the bottom. It's called a multi-beam. It's like a big sweep. So instead of just having one ping, one, one echo sounder, it's sweeping the bottom as it goes by. And that's what you're seeing is the bottom features right there. And this is, is it moving? Can't tell. Yeah, it is moving. That's a, a system that looks in the water column, and it's looking for fish, basically. So they can, while they're mapping and charting the bottom, they can also take a look at what's in the water column here. And yeah, these people are moving. They're real. They're actually <laughs> there. Right and you can tell with the timestamp, uh, USSO 2046. Looks like it's an hour off. But um, that's the beauty of telepresence. And the point is that that kid in Omaha can be pulling that up if they want to be part of this the value from an exploration standpoint is, guess what? The person who really might know what that feature is could be a geologist in Montana. And now we have the capability of calling up the geologist saying, what is that? Which is a really weird thing. If the ROV were being deployed right now, which I was hoping was the case, we could actually have real-time imagery of things. So remember when I showed you that sea cucumber, as they were videoing that, they could come uh, call back home and basically say, is this something new? Has anybody ever seen this before? To me, that's phenomenal. Having spent a lot of time on a ship, seeing things, saying, gosh, I wish I had somebody I could ask about this and really get some good information. So I'm going to close with one last slide, and it's a quote. And the quote is one that I think is particularly relevant here. And it's basically that science never appears so beautiful as when applied to the uses of human life or any use of its own engaging as agriculture and domestic economy. That's why we need to explore it. It has to have, ultimately, some value for society. But we've also got to maintain the excitement and the passion about what we're looking at, even if we don't know what we're looking at. And guess who this quote comes from? Thomas Jefferson, 210 years ago. So with that, thank you very much, and All right, we're, we're going to get started now with our next speaker, Lance Towers. He's the Director of Advanced Technology Programs for the Boeing Company. Uh, down in Huntington Beach, yesterday he was making snowmen, and tonight he's here with you. He's, he, as I said, he's the Director of Advanced Technology Programs, ATP, for Electronics and Information Solutions, which is a division of a within Boeing Network and Space Systems. And in this role, he oversees the Advanced Technology Programs businesses, which bridges maritime intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, as well as marine acoustics and proprietary programs. And so he's going to talk to you about some the development of some of the technologies that Rick showed you in, in his talk and some of the challenges of developing technologies and bringing them to the, to the marketplace. He's been with Boeing for 20 years 
and has held a number of positions, including electrical engineer, system engineer, integrated product team, and the lead is to the chief program engineer and systems designer. He has a, a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering and a master's degree in uh, science communication theory, both from Cal State Polytechnic University, Pomona. He's a professionally registered electrical engineer, and he's one of the members who now sits on this new federal advisory committee that guides what the nation will do in ocean exploration. It's called the OEAB, the Ocean Exploration Advisory Board, and it advises the administrator of NOAA and Rick and other leaders within NOAA. So please join me in welcoming Lance Towers. Thank you very much. Uh, when I was asked to do this talk a couple months ago, I couldn't have been more honored. And uh, I was with uh, Jerry and Rick back in the Baltimore Aquarium in September, and, and there was something that really stuck with me. There was a lot of scientists that were presenting their data, and I saw the exact same, I will be blunt, frustration that many of these scientists had presenting their data. Totally passionate about what they're doing, but they were really frustrated about the success and the backing and funding of these projects. And I went back and I was sitting down and I have um, some phenomenal uh, subject matter experts in maritime uh, system development, mechanical engineers, things of that nature. And I watched them have the same frustrated look when they had been working on an internal research and development project for three years only to have it stop in the last year. And when I started going through this process and I started teaching classes for Boeing and, and others, I started getting to the point where I figured out what the main problem was. And we were never really defining the problem, the project or the problem correctly. We would do it incomplete. And we get into a situation where I wanted to kind of cover the following. Not so much just the technology, because that would be easy to cover toward the end, but how can we do a better job in making these projects successful as we move forward? So the topic, as Jerry indicated, is making the case for developing to ocean exploration technology. And I completely agree with you, Rick. It is so much easier to put a rover on Mars than it is to have something operate at, five, you know, at 10,000 feet. So much easier. Now, my friends at NASA on the other side of Boeing will probably give me a call if they're listening to this. And I'll have a lot of emails and the debate come up. But I know I can, I, I can win that debate. And it's also defining the right technology. Not the coolest technology, the right technology. And then how technology, I'll cover it, has changed the way, and then going forward, why it will rapidly have a bigger impact as we go forward than it ever has in the past. So, making the case. So, unfortunately, a high percentage of projects that have been done for both ocean exploration and any other project that's been funded through government or other agencies or activities has failed. And it's basically the root cause is they've never really gone through and done a complete project definition. And, and what I really mean by this is, is most people have heard the, the phrase, who, what, why? People understand that. But for technology in a project, it has to be why, what, and how. And the number one statement you have to define is why. Now, as an engineer, and the reason why I got into management is I used to complain about how my bosses were running the projects, and then my boss got tired of me complaining, and then he said, you're now in charge, and I've been in management ever since, and I've been regretting it ever since, because I like being an engineer. But my heart is in how. How are you going to solve that problem? That's where I instinctively go to. And every project that I started off, and I'll just be blunt, every one that I started off with how failed. We were having that discussion at dinner. And it fails because I didn't solve why. What is easy? What are you going to do is easy. How are you going to do it is almost as easy. The hardest thing to solve is why. We have, to, we have to explore the oceans. That's not why. That's what. And if we can nail that thing down and be really successful in this, we will do much better. And the budget that we're talking about for the ocean exploration of 25 million doesn't even make sense. It's off by two orders of magnitude for it to be legitimate. But we put more money in other things that have far less consequences because they do a better job of capturing why. This is where we really have to, what you're talking about, that 
that instant data gratification. Got to get that tied back to the, 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 the next generation so they fall in love with ocean exploration. People have to fall in love across all demographics, not just sets. So what I say here is when I have all of my teams come forward and they, they want to come up with a project to develop new technology, I sit there and I pepper them on why. It has to have more than one why to be, to make it, to be able to scan, to be able to sell it. Because build it and they will come, build it, they will use it, really doesn't work. Works in a great movie, but it really doesn't work. So it is paramount for ocean exploration, it's paramount. It is so easy to fly a helicopter over a landmass and find something that you can see. It's dark at the bottom of the ocean. It's really cold down there. You have, as I think Bob Ballard said, when you're taking an ROV, you're looking through a straw and you're missing everything around it. We have to figure out how to do it better. So there are many reasons why we explore the ocean. And it starts from finding something that's been lost to the pursuit of the unknown, to the advancement of knowledge, science and education, environmental focus, and then economic and business reasons. That's pretty much what it is. So um, for reason 1A, and I call it 1A, you'll see why I get into 1A and 1B, is this finding something that's been lost typically applies to a section of the public. Investigation for the search of a missing aircraft, it captures people's interest, right? Excitement and intrigue, searching for the Titanic. What's gone on with the Titanic? How did they find it? Funding support is typically very fragmented and can be, but can be substantial. You can get a lot of backing for a short time. That is catastrophic for long-term thinking. So if you get to the next one, pursuit of the unknown, this appeals to the segment of the general public, like an engineer, like the people that really want to know what's going on, how healthy is our ocean, what is really going on with the, the whale population? Is it healthy? Is it not? So the engineering and sciences perspective, it's, I mean, this appeals to those two groups, engineering and science, the general excitement of the unknown. However, this suffers from attention span. And watching my kids grow up, this is a contributor. Video games, attention span, it just doesn't capture the interest long enough. And so, Everyone remembers, if you're my age or older, you remember that the race to the moon. And if you ever had a chance, if you have not seen the movie Apollo 13 or the HBO series From Here to the Moon, I recommend you watch it because it typifies this for even ocean exploration. Apollo 11, everybody tuned into it. By Apollo 13, nobody tuned into it until they had a failure. And that's a crime, in my opinion. Ocean exploration has the same thing. It is just we stop paying attention to it because it's something else. Oh, I've heard that so many times on the news. Every time I flip the channel, it's on the news. And after about two, three weeks, the news realizes that people are tired of it. They go to another topic. This is something that this, if you go after a project and you use this as your why, you better have a really short time frame to complete it because you're going to run out of attention span. Another one is environmental focus. It applies to a very specific segment of the public. Not everybody is environmentally conscious. Health, you know, example, what's the change in our acidity? What's the general health of our ocean? Funding support for this is a little bit more um, solid because the folks that are really environmentally conscious will typically back these projects. But it doesn't pull in the big dollar, and that's where we need to figure out how to tie this to other things. But it usually has special interest groups and members of Congress that are willing to fight for that. And you can see them, they stand out very clearly. You know where they're at, what district they're at. And this is, like I said, applies to a specific segment of the public. Then you get into the science and education, which for me as an engineer, that's all I care about. I just like to learn. It, the engineering communities, general excitement of the unknown. Funding support is tied to the balance of investment. How much money does it cost to do this project? And what is the intrinsic value you're going to pull it back? When is it going to come back? And feel free to interrupt me anytime with questions. Four, you have a question? Yeah, you 
turn it around a couple times, but one of the big whys is fear. It, like, we, we don't know what's going to happen to us. If we, if we miss this, what could hit us? You know, it's, it's uh, people buy on fear. That's true, but that also suffers from an attention span because people will shift to a different problem, right? And that's where, and, you know, I'm going to get into this, and I call it the trick of the why. And it's what I try to train my teams to come forward with a, a new technology. you got to figure out the trick. So, and again, in this one, from a funding perspective, economic and advancement, return on investment, this drives most of the funding. If you look at the fishing industry, anytime NOAA sets a fishing season that's shorter than they would like, what do they do? They fight back. There's a lot of interest in anything like this usually drives it. And if you want to figure out who drives what, if you're a big company, I work for Boeing, Wall Street sets what they want. If you're a small company that's funded by venture capitalists, they're looking for the real high risk return. They're, they know that if they invest money, there's a great chance that they lose it all. But there's that slim chance they'll make 100 times what they invested. If you're a small company, self-funded, they're looking for the sure thing. Something that is really, really low risk that allows them to survive. So you have to see where all of these play into. So maximizing the why. I sit down and I will drill, you know, to you and I'm talking about finding out where you failed. As I drill my team to find out, is there more than one why that this is going to survive? Why do we do this? So again, you create the Venn diagram and say, find something lost, pursuit of the unknown. That's why I brought, put those two together. Science and education, environmental focus, and then you look at the overlaps. Where can you get more than one why legitimately tied into this to get better, strong backing? Because if you only have one congressional member pushing for you, and that person gets voted out, you lost your support. You have to have a bigger tie. You have to have a bigger pull. Get that cross coupling, and then you will do much better. So I always say, when I, if I look for them, I say, you got to strive for the triple. <laughs> Chances of you getting a home run are slim and none. If you get the home run, I guarantee I will be the biggest cheerleader. I will be out there marketing and driving it to get it through. But if you get the triple, you're pretty good shape. We look at this, and I went back in statistics, and I found out that most of the projects, high 90s, that had at least a triple, completed all the way through. The technology got completed, validated, and is in use today by other things. Doubles usually are okay. Singles, almost everyone fails, unless there is a specific, specific short-term duration it had to be done to fill a void. I call that the grand slam. Like I said, when I see one, and every so often, it's like every two, three years, someone comes with that grand slam. I can't even get the person off the stage. I'm, I'm constantly figuring out how I can leverage this and drive this to the next step. This is how you can be better at getting projects funded, sustained, and successful. And it, like I said, the thing that I, that I took out of that meeting in Baltimore, I completely stopped listening to everybody else. I just watched the facial expressions of the scientists who I can tell that they were bleeding to get this done and were never getting fully backed. And I remember going back and I watched, you know, I might get a little emotional, I watched where I actually shot down someone's idea. And I, ended up, I personally stopped it on the third year. And I remember that facial expression and I went, maybe I wasn't good enough to help him find the trip. I never, it just, everything was the same. Everybody's trying to do good things, but how do we get the community, the world, this country backing this to drive it through? Yes? Why is NASA doing such a better job of this? Why do we care more about exploring? I don't understand how well, they can do the Grand Slam with exploring Mars and we can't do it for the oceans right here on Earth. And that's because they're marketing. Now, the thing that they're still living off of is the 60s. <laughs> They, if you, what they did, in, you know, I'll be honest, what they did in the 60s was phenomenal. What we've done since that is not that big of a step. If you really think about it, you're putting a human being on the moon in the 1960s with computers that this blows away the computer capacity, yeah. right? 
And we did that in the 60s. We haven't even gone back, right? So they're living off that excitement. We need to figure out how to make exploring the oceans as exciting as exploring um, the moon or anything else. However, we still have to address, I mean, if you watched the space shuttle, the first few launches were great. And then you had the tragedies, right? Then everybody got washed into it. And then it went away again. Then the public really got interested on the last flight and then watching the shuttles go down the street. There really wasn't anything in between that. No news, no nothing. It was only when they started wrapping it up. Now they're thinking about the next evolution. It's really far away. We need to figure out how, like what you're talking about, getting it into the communities, get it on the news. Why, why the public doesn't get discovering it, that new uh, sea cucumber? Doesn't understand that. How do we tie that back in? We've got to get the next generation tied into that so they fall in love with it as more as what we do. Because I run the Enigma business within Boeing. I don't, I don't reveal anything that flies. In fact, most people have no clue that Boeing does autonomous underwater vehicles. That's my business. People think I forgot to put the wings on it and I have the prop on the bottom hand. So I'm going to get an email from that. So um, get close to my retirement, so I'll be all right. Um, so yeah, I have people come in and they go, I want to do a technical review of your, your technology. And they go, because I do something that goes into space. I, I deal with harsh environments. And it usually takes me an hour before I stop laughing. Because one atmospheric change has nothing to do with you go down and underwater. And you know, in an autonomous air vehicle, I call it not autonomous. You're still talking to it. Yeah. You can drive it. When we launch an Echo Ranger, it's gone for two days. And we kind of go, we expect it to come back up over here. And if it doesn't, then we have to go find it. I can find an air vehicle on the land. You try to find that needle in a haystack on the bottom of the ocean, that's the challenge. And so, yeah, I get to be the, uh, the guy that's different than everybody else in my company, and I cherish it from that perspective. So this is the thing that I try to drive into my teams, is how to pull out the why. Find that real good answer that allows it to survive for multiple reasons. Because if one of them goes away, that's not what you want to kill it. You want it to stand on its own. So the trick of the why is defining the intersection. Economic, find something that's been lost, appearance, advancement, <coughs> pursuit of the unknown. That's the trick. Now, here's the thing that you have to tie into this. The trick is the why is addressing as many as possible, but establish only one funding source. That is counterintuitive, correct? It's counterintuitive. If you have multiple organizations funding a project, it only takes one of them to back out to damage the project. And so usually, like when I see someone come forward and say, I'm going to get money from o and I'm going to get money from uh, NOAA, I go, uh-oh. That means if there's two funding sources, by definition, you are on the bottom of their priority list. So if funding gets cut, you're the first one out. So you find the greatest number of backers that have one dominant funding source that you can survive with. And this is where I watch the second aspect of where projects fail, is people go, I've got three wives and I've got three funding sources, and I go, ooh, ooh, just from history. Not because it makes sense, it's just history. It only takes one to damage the project. And then I think you were making the comment that you said it needed to be 100 million, we only got 10 million, and we use bailing wire and duct tape to get it to work. That's what ends up resulting with that. So, this is where I said before, and I say this to these folks, you gotta find multiple wise, one main funding source, then you are in really good shape. If you do that and drive that why first, the rest of the problem becomes a piece of cake. So the purpose, and I say, what is not the purpose? What is the purpose? It is not developing the technology that we're going to use. It's what, you know, what are we actually going to do? 
You know, and it can be as simple as ocean mapping, water chemistry evaluation, the search of a lost ship, evaluating installed infrastructure, defining the what in simple terms. Because as an engineer, the one thing I know I will never bring to a conversation when I go out to dinner with my wife and our friends is I'm going to talk about something on engineering. I will kill the room. So I'll get into the details and everything. So you have to make it in simple terms that it translates back to the why. If you have the why and then you start deviating from something that supports it, you create doubt. And then someone who else is competing for your money finds a way to go after it. You open that door. So you have to make it really solid. So technology development, the do's and don'ts. I'm going to start off with the do's. Developing the engineering solution that effectively supports why and the what is a must. Find the right engineer, engineering solution. As an engineer, I love to reinvent the wheel. That's just my DNA. However, as a manager, I need to figure out how to stop that because it is completely a waste of money. And and the other part is, if you start with something new, that's a risk. If you're trying to do something new for the first time, that's a risk. If you're reusing something that's been proven before, that's a great move. Um, not the most capable solution, the right solution. Sometimes we'll jump to this, and then we result in an overrun, and we damage the project. Challenge standing myths or preconceived notions are the doable. And I'm going to show you a video and I'll kind of uh, annotate a few things where certain um, educational labs said what we did was going to be impossible. And we did it on the first try. Because we decided to ignore what someone said. We tried in the past and didn't work. Because that is a, that is a, a some person's pride gets in the way. And if you, you have to figure out how to remove that element from your efforts. So this is where we can really do a great job. So challenging the standing myths, plagiarize history. Reuse it. If it works, use it again. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, that's the best thing to do, is reuse someone's technology. And someone says, well, that was done in the 70s. Does it work? Yes. Hmm. We try, and they'll go, well, we're going to try this new valve. And I've watched so many times, we'll try this new valve, only for us to migrate back to what we have, um, I have a, this, uh, what I call it, an um, uh, independent review team. We've hired in general, a, a bunch of new college grads into the maritime business. And I have this engineering review team that's made up of about four or five senior engineers that have over 50 years of experience. The team by itself is over 200 years of combined experience. And they review, and I have to you know, caution them a little bit, but they'll go, why aren't you doing this? It works. And you watch the young engineer, and you have to figure out, I have to coach them not to kill the spirit of ingenuity, because they'll take that concrete trowel and smooth it right over. <laughs> but I have to sit there and pull them aside and say, you've got to keep me excited. Mm -hmm. And then you, they look back at me like my dad does and go, okay. You know? And then they'll convey it out in the right way, and they'll get the information out to the point where they'll say, in really effective terms, when we tried this before, this is what we had to look out for because we ran into these mistakes. And if they say the message perfectly or close to it, the engineer, the young engineer goes, I got it. And they may say, I'm going to still do it my way. But they instinctively go back to their desk and they try to investigate what they were just told so that they don't make a mistake. And their success rate has skyrocketed when we married that group together because there's just not enough of us in the maritime expertise. There are more engineers in non-maritime application by orders of magnitude. We've got to figure out, figure out how to flip that. So plagiarize, reuse over and over again. Don't ignore the potential impact of the political aspect of a new technology. And this has been done over and over again. But there's ways that some people have just figured out, you know, that we have to make this change. And it's how you convey it. Um, I know when I'm in an argument with someone and I just say, just do it, I know where that's going to go. It just doesn't work. So, unfriend man, how did you replace the human? That is a thing that you will hear today. 
The Air Force had a hard time adopting autonomous air vehicles. Um, is unmanned just trading risks. If I have something that's unmanned, it could be unsafe. It could run into somebody else. You have those questions that pop up. You have to be able to answer those questions. How is it more important than something else? How is your project more important than their project? You have to understand that and be able to quantify that. Wait, if we go down this path, I may lose my job. How many of you have heard that? All right? We have to figure out how to make that new path provide more options and opportunities than ever before. One of my favorite examples, and if you ever had a chance to read the Invention and Technology magazine, it comes out every quarter, quarter they have a great article. And it, about a decade ago, they had the uh, topic on the invention of the sewing machine, the end of all seamstress uh, jobs, and the complete rise of unemployment. That's what they predicted. <laughs> they said the sewing machine was going to devastate the American economy. It had the exact opposite effect. Because they sat there and said, there's a machine that's going to do what I've done with a needle and thread for hundreds of years. It completely scared everybody. It scared people in Congress. There were people in Congress trying to kill and outlaw the sewing machine. It's the same thing today. It's just a little bit different. Unmanned air vehicles. It was pretty much at the time where there was that one Air Force pilot that got shot down behind enemy lines when someone said, what was he doing? He was just taking pictures. So let me get this straight. You had the person goes, we're just taking pictures. Why can't you just put it on an autonomous air vehicle and do it? If you lose it, you just lost the vehicle. What did the Air Force want to do? I don't want to lose the manned platform. Well, if you look at the statistics, the Air Force has not dropped in any of their manned platform. They just now have autonomous air vehicles, too. Their mission expanded. But the initial fear was, you're going to remove the manned platforms. You're not, you're, we're not going to be safe. That was the fear because it was a change. Change is always scary, right? Now, I, got, I had the distinct privilege of having a bunch of managers that ignored every one of my requests of not doing something different. I was a firefighter, what they called, where every so often they would put me on a new program that was in trouble, and I would have to go take it over. And every time they did that, I couldn't sleep. I'm like, oh, I, don't know. I don't know the technology. I don't know the customer. I don't know the people. After about doing it a dozen times, I got to the point where it's like, OK. right? And it really trained me. And I had some really effective managers that realized that I had some major deficiencies. And they just flat out ignored my request and forced me to learn and embrace change. I can't thank them enough. You would have asked me 25 years ago, I would have had a totally different opinion. But now, I don't have a problem having a, my boss say, Lance, I want you to take this over. I don't even ask the question, where is it? What's the problem? I just say, OK, where do I have to go? And that new excitement, I've now learned to cherish. Not in my DNA. I learned that over time. So we've got to learn how to deal with this. Because anytime you do something new, especially where we're going to be going in the future, we're going to be changing how we do it. So in Boeing, like I said, we've been doing this for almost 50 years. Heritage Rockwell, that's how Boeing got into this. They bought the Rockwell company in the late 90s. We had been developing manned platforms since the 60s. We did a lot of test shapes for the United States Navy. We did a lot of swimmer sleds. And then most recently we have, you can go out on YouTube and type in Echo Ranger and search that. It's a 10,000 foot uh, wet autonomous underwater vehicle. When people say wet, of course it's an ocean. It's going to get wet. What they mean by a wet vehicle is that the outer line is not the pressure boundary. Water goes in all the crevices. All the electronics are protected in smaller pressure vessels inside that. Because if this was going to go down to 10,000 feet, it, that's outer mold line would have to be metal this thick. It is actually, that's composite fiber that's about a quarter inch thick. And water goes in every one of the crevices. It has wet make cables, just like the oil industry does. They build, they build these oil filled pressure balanced cables that they use to connect electronics. It's what we call a wet vehicle. A dry vehicle is where the outer mold line is the pressure boundary, 
just like a manned submarine is. The outer boundary is the pressure boundary. This is our long-term mine reconnaissance system, and I'll show you a video. This is a what looks like a torpedo. It's launched and uh, recovered out of a moving Los Angeles class submarine to search for sea-based mines that may have been putting in an area that could damage our submarines. It goes out there and, and uses what this is a project that we've done in the past, it's no longer in operation. We uh, took breast cancer algorithms that look for the density differences, which we used to basically characterize a sea-based mine. It had onboard navigation, it would see something, it would characterize that, log the latitude, longitude, and depth, and then come back to the submarine and be recovered and put back into the same torpedo tube that it was launched out of. That was what we were told by uh, several educational labs was going to be impossible. So, what you hear, you can actually look at the marine technology. This is back in 2007. It was, like I said before, for the autonomous search and identification of emplaced mines. This is what we're doing right now. We've got a crater in place with uh, NOAA. We are working with them to see, is it possible to take multiple sensors, one off the hull of the ship, one off of the ROV, put them both at the bottom of the Echo Ranger and have it do the same mission, but it, you know, by itself. Could you do that? And so we actually did a rock a fish survey off the coast of Catalina, and the initial imaging, we came back and the scientists looked at the data said, extremely stable imagery. Because it isn't tethered to the surface ship. It's fully on its own. It was able to navigate and, and avoid this, the obstacles, go around, do the sonar, and take pictures at the same time. This is potentially a change. This is currently done with the surface ship. So why technology will play a greater role as we move forward? And it's going to be very, very simple to see. This is what's happening today. Here it is, the government surface ship fleet. Here is the United States Navy submarine fleet. There's no way with today's budget that we're going to be able to keep up unless we try to do something different. This one thing right now is going to force, in my opinion, this is just my opinion, new technology that will allow us to do the same or similar mission, but for a lot less expense, because we're falling behind. We're falling behind. NOAA's system, I think has 16 service ship, ships. Many of them are 30 plus years old. The Navy is decommissioning more submarines than they're replacing them. So how do you continue this path and say, yeah, but we can still meet all of our mission requirements? This is when I see this data, I kind of go, this is going to be the thing that forces us to really figure out how to do things differently. That's why personally I believe as we move forward, technology investment in ocean exploration is going to be rapidly affecting how we do our, our jobs. And in some cases, it's going to frustrate some folks. That's just what's going to happen. In the long term, I think it will be a huge benefit for us as soon as we can figure out how to get our public more interested. So this is what I see right now. When I saw this data, I went, oh boy, this is going to make a change. Just like, if I can do an analogy, what happened to the defense industry at the end of the Vietnam War? It almost disappeared. Those things happen. When changes in public and funding go, things change. The defense companies that got smarter, they figured out how to do things cheaper and better. It's the same thing we have to do here. NASA, I think uh, you had the question of why are they more successful? They're still living off the footage and the folks at our age that really fell in love with the space program in the 60s. That's where our compassion from. And now the next generation is seeing some of that data. And then you had the perfect movie, Apollo 13 in the mid-1990s which re-stirred the passion. It's those things that we've got to figure out how to get into our environment here. So, we need to make, we need to figure out how to make it as compelling as it says to go into the moon. We need to figure that out. Uh, but, address, but we also have to address our attention span. Because making it as exciting as going back to the moon means it's gonna be great for a while, and then it's gonna fade. How do we make it great and stay? That's the number one problem I think we have to get work. 
need to make the case to go public industry and government to significantly increase the funding and, back, and backing. This is where, when I saw the budget, I was stunned. It's two orders of magnitude off, minimum. And this is where, where I think we, as a community, need to figure out how to drive this message to them and say, look, you're spending a lot of money doing this, and why is that anywhere near as important as this? Create new technology for ocean exploration is a must, but it has to be the right technology. Not what we want to do because it's cool, it has to be the right technology. And unfortunately for some engineers like me, that can be very frustrating. And I have to sit there and look at myself in the mirror and say, am I doing the right thing? I have to challenge myself. Um, you've heard of, uh, of you know, people say, think outside the box. I like that when you're trying to solve a problem that you've never figured out before. But most problems have been figured out before at some level in the past. I don't want you thinking outside the box. I'd rather you think about how to reuse what was done and get it done better, faster, cheaper, so you can do more projects. Because if you, you do the best product, the most important thing, and you shove every dime into it, that's the only thing that's going to get done. And you're only going to scratch the surface of what we need to do. Define what we need to do, identify the right solution set. We waste more money in reinventing the wheel, and I'll say it over and over again. Because even in my own company, I'll see that, and I'll guarantee I'm going to get an email on this one, is I'll go, you know, Rick's already solved that problem. He did that three years ago. Yeah, I know, but that's Rick, and he's doing it over there. It's the same company. If we do it in the same company, I guarantee we're doing it in the same country. This is how I call, I call focusing our technology development. Do it right. So on summary, and there's a video we'll show right at the end of this, is we have to clearly establish why. Make that rock solid. Sit back, sometimes pull our own emotions out of it, and sit there and say, what can we do to make this done? What can we do, you know, establish this for the right reason. Then the right requirements for the what. And then select the right engineering solution when that's required to make that happen. <coughs> so let's go to that video. And I'll kind of show you where certain things that we've done. And again, I have the distinct privilege of doing the thing that doesn't fly. It doesn't go into space. It swims in the ocean. And I could be happy. So one of the things that we've done in Boeing where we were the worst at was bragging about our own stuff. We were so having so much fun, we stopped doing filming. So this is showing back, we've got pictures of what we've done over the last 30, 40 years. And members of that independent review team are actually the folks that you would see in these pictures. We've done things from torpedo shapes to acoustic systems to uh, fluid dynamics to the long-term mine reconnaissance system to Echo Ranger. And you're seeing right now how it's launched and recovered. And what I want you to pay attention to is that launch and recovery of something like this is expensive, correct? This is not cheap. And we've got to figure out how to make these autonomous underwater vehicles operate longer so that you can divorce the cost of the surface ship when it's not needed to be dedicated to that. So we have this, and it's, it's Echo Ranger. It's been in service almost 10 years. It has the ability to avoid undersea mounts. It has the ability to um, uh, navigate around activities. It can do what we call a mow the lawn pattern of doing a, a sonar survey and come back. And if it's something in its way, it knows how to get over it and go around it. We perfected that over time because every single time, this is what's entertaining, every time we've gone out and done a mission with Echo Ranger, usually we get information just like you were saying, we just don't have the, uh, the maps there. It's flat here. And then we come back and we look at the actual data and it went, over a 300 foot seamount back down, and it's going, this is anything but flat. And that's just because we don't have the data. We don't have the baselining information to really be able to assess these things. And when we first started doing these things, it ran into stuff. And we came back and said, well, we, we realized it should have been able to go around it. However, depending on how fast it had to rise, it's going forward about three knots. We had to figure out how to teach it to do a spiral and look until it got over and so every time we came back, 
we saw another set of information. We said, oh, we have to create another behavior. And we call our autonomy behaviors. How it behaves when it sees an incident or an issue. And we basically have got those behaviors um, hammered out over probably a thousand dives. And now we're pretty good. But we know that we're still going to see something there. You know, right now the, the, the threat is fishing nets. Not stationary fishing nets. Fishing nets that are coming at us like if someone's crawling. Because they're going to be going pretty fast. We're not. So we're going to have to be able to see that faster and either be able to dive below it. And those nets are pretty long. So those are the things that we're still working on and uh, we're spending a little bit of our time to make sure that we're safer from that perspective. Now fishing uh, trawling that catches echo rangers is going to have an interesting day. Yeah. Um, they'll pull it up because those, those things are pretty big. But it, we just don't want to have that situation. So we're working on those, those, uh, those additional behaviors. So this is why I say you have to define the why, the what, and the how, and the number one thing is the why. And it's what I learned because I failed multiple times on projects. And it's not, it's not fun to fail. If you like failing, I want to have a discussion with you. But if you figure it out, why you want to do something, and, it, and why is it important, and you nail that down, you've pretty much done over half the problem. And you've done probably very little in the actual engineering side of it. Because the why is that, is that powerful. You have a question? So I want to open it up to you guys, and feel free to ask me any questions, but this was based on a series of like 25, 30 years of experience, 20 with Boeing, and uh, part of that was with, with Rockwell, is watching and kind of tallying who was successful and who was not. And then I realized the persons that were successful really had the ability to stand up in front of a group that wants to justify a project and can answer all the questions of why better than any other part of their presentation and then people just sat there and went okay i got it so many people come forward and go like this this is a great idea i really want to build this technology and the person goes for what why what are we going to do this for but it's a great technology it just doesn't go 